So I'm Julie Sampson. I'm the director of the Scheinfeld Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation here at Santa Barbara City College. And actually, this is a really awesome event because we are kicking off our National Entrepreneurship Month in which we honor entrepreneurs past, present, future. This is a national movement all through the month of November. So let's start it here. All of you are entrepreneurial in some way, either past, present, future, something that you're anticipating. And we want to honor all of you. So let's kick this off in the right way and just give each other a hand. We are the ones that are changing the world. Yes. <laughs> So the Scheinfeld Center is all about supporting you in your entrepreneurial endeavors, whatever they might be, whether that's to start your own business or work entrepreneurial within a business that you're employed by. We started the Get Real Accelerator this summer, um, and this the founders that you will see pitching today went through the Accelerator, a six-month program with customized startup support tailored to their needs. They focused on six-month milestones. They closed skill gaps. They navigated common startup challenges. They expanded their professional networks. They attained seed funding. And uh, they, this uh, accelerator was open to previous winners of the Scheinfeld uh, New Venture Challenge. And so I want to show you our lineup. The reason that we brought this about was because we have the the um, uh, we have the experiential academic program. We have enterprise launch, w where students launch a product or service in a single semester. The new venture challenge and a bunch of support that all of that rests on, including our student community internships, our events that we do, our no cost business consulting, and the makerspace that we have here on campus, but there was a gap because at the end of the New Venture Challenge, people are, we found our students are still needing support, and that's where the Get Real Accelerator comes in with that tailored support. We wouldn't be here, though, if it wasn't for the collaborations that we have within the community, and we would like to recognize that the uh, SBCC Foundation donated the $10,000 that these students are competing for today. That will go to one of the founders. And we're also very thankful for the Santa Barbara Chamber of Commerce, who is donating a year membership to the winner, and also Impact Hub, who has been generous to donate a month of uh, membership there to actually all of the founders uh, that participated in the Get Real Accelerator. So, plus, okay, there's this opportunity. In National Entrepreneurship Month, we recognize that uh, there are needs that startups have, and really, we've heard the phrase before, it takes a village. It takes, all of you have gifts and talent, you have skills, and being able to share those with those that are rising up, that are maybe don't have that level of skill, that they're needing to work through uh, a certain thing with their business, you know, we wanted to provide an opportunity for you to reach out and to be able to provide some support no matter where you're at. I mean, we have the foundation, uh, the generous grant from the foundation, but there's also mentoring, uh, helping with any kind of business skills, whether it's videotaping, marketing, you name it, uh, startups can use it. And so we have actually a drop box at the check-in table outside. So if you, as you watch the pitches, if you feel s compelled to maybe reach out to a certain founder and offer something, or uh, to offer the founders in general, from what you see today, there's the opportunity to do that, or you can just talk with them directly because they'll be outside during the break. And I gotta say, students, I hope you won't consider yourself that you don't have anything to offer. Actually, in the conversations uh, during, during our learning labs, there was a lot of need to reach out to students and, and uh, 
get your input and support because you are very technologically inclined, you know, which can be very helpful. So please, if there's something that you feel compelled to share with uh, any of the founders, um, please go ahead and feel that you're a part of the equation as well. So uh, we rely a lot on collaboration within the community and the MIT Enterprise Forum is one of the collaborations that we have that allows students like you to network and get very good technological um, and entrepreneurial uh, cutting edge knowledge and connections and this happens every month. And we are very fortunate, actually, to have Matthew Stotts, who serves as president of the MIT Forum with us. He is also serving as a shark. But let's go ahead and welcome him and give him a hand. Thank you. Because of our regional coordinator in global trade, I'm able to offer no-cost stipend, uh, stipends to any, any students who want to attend these, and uh, there's the QR code that my interns taught me to get savvy on, and now they're over all of the marketing materials. <laughs> so you can use QR codes to follow or just talk with us out at the desk. Um, so what is our roadmap today? So uh, we are going to do this welcome that we're doing. Uh, we are going to hear from Gary Kravitz. Um, uh, on what angel investors look for, and that'll give you really good background as you watch the pitches today to understand what's going on in the investor's mind and kind of look at things from that mindset. Uh, it will be a good experience for you to think critically in that way. And then uh, we will go ahead with the pitching and the judges will have time to deliberate. And during that time, we are going to clear out and actually go onto the patio where we'll have refreshments for you. And um, we're very fortunate to have uh, Sylvia Franco Comer of Casa de Comer Salsa and her husband, Sean. Um, they participated in the uh, accelerator and um, have an awesome product, and we're so fortunate to have them sharing that with you today. So please enjoy that. And there's cookies, too, and water. <laughs> okay, and then we'll come back in. The, the winner will be announced, and um, uh, feedback will be given, and then we can continue networking out on the patio. So these are the four founders who participated in the Get Real Accelerator. And uh, they all made very incredible progress during the Accelerator. I would uh, like to point out that the, they were there as former winners of the New Venture Challenge. And what's really important here is that this would not have happened if we didn't have the collaboration with Women's Economic Ventures, who is now um, operating the Spirit of Entrepreneurship Awards. And uh, that, so since 2011, the SOE has raised more than $87,000 for students like you, right? <laughs> and this also goes to high school entrepreneurs, too, who compete. So we are very uh, fortunate to have on our shark panel today Kathy O'Dell, who is the C up and coming CEO of uh, Weave. So, thank you so much for being here, Kathy. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so those are the four founders. Now, I would like to recognize one of those founders. You will find that there are three competing today. And actually, Sylvia of Casa de Comer Salsa. Um, uh, did not submit an entry, and she is here today nonetheless to share uh, her product with you and her story, and we'll be hearing a lot more from her because she has some interesting, this is called the Get Real Accelerator, right? So she has some Get Real stories about what her uh, journey has been, and so we would like to uh, so look forward for that um, in our social media and on our website. But I just wanted to honor her and point out some of the things that she attained during the accelerator, as shown here. So 
Uh, when I uh, talked to Sylvia at the beginning of the cel accelerator, I think she was in seven stores, and um, she, uh, in order to uh, scale their production and distribution, they improved their packaging to expand their self li shelf life, and they are working with a co-packer now, um, Baba, and uh, they also are distributing now with DPI, specialty foods, and they increased their production capacity from 1,000 units per month to 5,000. And look at in six months. In six months, the sale revenue increased actually in the last five months, 103%. Where's Sylvia? Sylvia, can you stand up? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for bring, being such a strong participant in the Accelerator and showing us how hustle and passion goes. We appreciate it. Uh, so next, we also are here because we had awesome mentors in the Accelerator. And I would really like, if you're here in the room, could you stand up so that we can honor you? I know we have one over here, and yes, over here, Eric, Robin, excellent, Gary, John. Please give them a huge hand. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much for uh, share. So the mentors worked one on one. They were paired with a, a particular founder, but they actually worked very collaboratively and um, helped a number of founders in the accelerator. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And of course, we talked about the sponsors that made this all happen, the awards that are going on today. But also, these are the businesses that, uh, represented by our mentors that participated. So we want to honor them as well. Thank you so much. So before we get going, as I said, we are going to hear from one of the Get Real mentors, uh, Gary Kravitz. And uh, we're so fortunate that Gary is with us to share with you what do investors look at in the startups that they invest in. And Gary serves as the Central Coast Director of Tech Coast Angels, where he evaluates applications of Tech Coast Angels funding and assists companies in their presentations. He also provides introductions to several angel and venture funding networks. He serves as a SCORE mentor and has served our business community as well as our students in amazing ways, including in areas of employee relations, HR, financing, management, startups, planning, venture capital, and technology, only to name a few. What he's going to do today is hop up here and go ahead and get you savvy about what the investors are going to be looking for. Thank you, Gary. So you may have heard the term angel investors in the past. Some of you haven't. And angel investors basically are individual investors who are between the uh, funding that you are putting in out of your own pocket or from friends and family who are giving you money just because they want to support you, but not necessarily because they expect to get rich. Uh, and the other end of the spectrum people get money from is from um, venture capitalists who are looking for companies, usually they like to see somebody who's going to be worth one, two, or three hundred million by the time they get sold so the venture capital company can make many hundreds of millions of dollars and they're not too interested in, uh, in spending their time on the thousands and hundreds of thousands of companies that are starting up but who really haven't proven themselves. So. The angel investors are looking for people who are making some progress, but they're, they're ready to get them to the next step to the point where they get a real, uh, a real company going. And one of the, one of the ways that this, um, this competition has been structured is very similar to how companies present to angel investors, um, people who are not 
representing a billion dollar fund and people who aren't their friends and family who want to wish them good luck, but people who are looking for interesting companies and are willing to invest a little bit of their money, knowing it's a big risk. Um, there's most of the people who are considered angel investors are high net worth individuals and except for one particular exception, um, companies are not allowed to even solicit funds from individuals who are not high net worth individuals. Uh, it's against the Sur Securities and Exchange Commission. A couple of years ago, um, President Obama started a new plan where there are online companies who allow companies to go out and present their wares online to crowdfunding, who will get small amounts of stock, can invest a small amount of money, and can raise a limited amount of money from these sources. The whole idea of getting accredited investors is to keep women's and, and um, women who are trying to raise families and poor people from putting all their savings into something and then not have anything to live on. They want to make sure that investors are people who can afford to lose the money because in most startups, that's what happens. They lose the money. Um, the, the angel investors, besides offering money, can offer introductions to other people, maybe it's customers, maybe it's suppliers, maybe it's additional investors. And after a while, when things get a little further along, they can also make introductions to venture capitalists. Um, the way that angel investors work is they don't get paid for helping the company. They, they take some stock in the company and they provide money and they provide some advice. Depends on what the company needs in the way of advice, but they're usually there, since they've already got money invested, they're very motivated to help out the company. So they're, they're people with lots of experience that can help the companies grow. Um, if an investor or group of investors who are working together uh, are investing something like 20% or 15% or 25% uh, of the investment into the company, they might expect a board seat. In some cases, they don't want to even accept a board seat because they don't have the time to do it. Uh, the typical investment from, from the accredited investors, the people with a high net worth, are, are typically 10,000 to two, 2 million. The 2 million end is usually not one individual. It's possible it could be one. But usually, there's networks of, of uh, angels like Tech Coast Angels, we have 350 members, and we may have 30 members investing uh, all together, perhaps, with a million dollars, but we very seldom see any one investor invest that much. And they like, they like to share the risk, and also uh, the investors like to see other investors there, so there's more resources to call on. Now, it may seem that they're being greedy because they want a 10 to, they want 15, uh, I'm sorry, five to 20% return on investment. That's what they're looking for ideally. The reason they do that is because nine out of 10 of the companies they invest in never give them any money, they fail. So if one out of 10 gives them money uh, and that one gives them 10 times return, they break even. If they're lucky, they'll do better than break even. But that's, they're not being guilty, they're just trying to make up for all the losses in the companies they try to help that don't work out. So, um, what, what uh, the angel investors are looking for is first and foremost, they're introduced to a founder. And the first thing they do is look at who's running this company, what's their capability, what's their motivation. In a lot of cases, it's somebody who has an idea but really has no idea how to make it into a company. So they're looking for someone who has a vision, a passion, uh, and commitment to the company and if they get a little bit of investment money, they're going to be putting all their efforts into it, and they're beginning, they'll be getting some of their friends and relatives to help out and, and additional people to go on the management team. A lot of times when a company is just starting out, the management team are people who are not working full time. They're people who are just getting advice, maybe for stock, maybe for a small amount of payment. Uh, once they get some investment money, then some of them might join the team. The other thing they're looking for is a company that has scalability, which means they can grow quickly. So they get this money, and they hope in a year or two at most, the company's actually able to support itself. 
um, unless they need some additional money for even increased growth. The, the bottom line of what they're looking for, if they're doing an investor, they're doing investment, is to make money at the end of the investment period. So they're looking for a company that will sell to make enough money for the founders and also pay back uh, additional profits to the investors. And the, the way they can, uh, they can determine how much they would get with a reasonable sales price is that they want their, the price that they pay for the stock to be low enough so if the company does exit, um, there'd be a reasonable amount of that money that comes up out of the sale that would go to the investors. So that's sort of the, the bottom line. But to get a little bit more detailed, here are some of the specific things in a presentation to angel investors that uh, you should be thinking about. And whether, usually this is done with a PowerPoint presentation. It might be done with a casual conversation with an investor. It could be in a business plan outline or uh, a, a very short business plan. But this is, these are the specifics of what angel investors are looking for, which are pretty much the same as what venture capitalists are looking for, except the angels are willing to take bigger risks and um, invest at a much earlier time. So the first thing is, who is your company? Uh, but the main thing they're looking for at the beginning to get their attention is, what are you doing? A lot of people will present, we're the best thing in the world and we're gonna make lots of money and you have no idea what they're even doing. So they want to know what the problem is they're there to solve. And that's the way a company starts up and makes money is to have a problem they found and a way to solve it. Um, sometimes the solutions are just simply marketing and business solutions. Sometimes they're technology solutions. Um, they're looking for, the investors are looking for what the features and benefits are of the product or service offered so that they can see why a customer might be interested as opposed to what's currently available. The next thing is a business model, which sometimes is rather complicated, and that's how is a business gonna make money? There's some people that start websites, they give away the website information for free, and unfortunately, that doesn't bring any money to pay back the investments. So they're, they're trying to find out um, how you're planning to make money and how you're gonna get to the point where you're big enough to be worthwhile. They want to see a presentation, and each of these are like maybe one PowerPoint presentation slide. Uh, what the marketing opportunity is, how big it is, how you're going to do sales, how you're going to do marketing. Next question is, if it's such a great opportunity, why isn't other companies doing the same thing? So what is the competition? How do you compare with the competition? What is the barrier to entry, which means why can't someone else do what you're doing tomorrow and be just as good as you are? So the barriers sometimes are lack of knowledge by uh, other possible competitors, or it may be first to market. Uh, the next thing that they look at, once you get their interest with these first seven things, is what are your financial projections? Because your financial projections will give an idea of how there's potential for that investor to make money. Uh, they're also looking at the management team, and as I explained before, a lot of times at an early stage, there may be one or two people working in the company, and there may be other people who are outside advisors that are part of the team. And so they're looking at the whole team to see how the various aspects are being handled. They're gonna look at your timeline for developing your products. They're gonna look at milestones and use of funds, how long it's gonna take you to grow, and what the investment money they're giving you will be used for and how it's gonna be beneficial. The next thing they're gonna look is how to validate the market. Um, and this is pre-sales. They're looking for potential suppliers, potential users, potential uh, publicity in the media that shows that there's people who are interested in what you have. And the last thing is how are you gonna make me money? And that relates to how much of the percentage ownership of the company they're gonna get or how much money they're putting in then they look at what the potential of the company is um, at five or seven years when it's sold or go public uh, and how much that would bring back to them. And again, they're, they're looking for that 10 to 20 times return on an investment to make up for all the companies that lose money. So that's the bottom line, very close summary, but now you have some idea of what angel investors are. So you, you could talk to me during the break.
<laughs> Thank you so much, Gary. Uh, okay, so uh, are you ready to get on with the competition? Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. So, first of all, what we're going to need is some sharks. So, luckily, we have them right up front here. What I'd like to do is introduce you to them. Okay, so starting with, uh, in alphabetical order, with Tyler Dobson. So, Tyler is Senior Vice President of Commercial and Technology Banking with Wells Fargo Bank. Tyler has over 17 years of finance experience and manages a range of technology, commercial, and industrial-based companies. He helps both emerging and later stage companies with debt and equity capital, as well as providing scalable financial tools to improve treasury management and payment processing, automation, and efficiency. He earned his, his BA in business economics from the University of California. Tyler, thank you so much for being here. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> We're also very fortunate to have Ju Julie Henley McNamara, who is an operating partner at Entrada Ventures. Julie has been involved with a number of startups and technology companies throughout her career and she had product roles with eToys, Rent.com, IAC, and Demand Media, which is now Leaf Group. Julie left Demand Media a year after their IPO and shifted into consulting and advisory roles before joining Entrada Ventures. She has a BS in business from Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. Thank you for being here, Julie. <laughs> Now, I mentioned Kathy previously. She is CEO-elect of Women's Economic Ventures and a serial entrepreneur who founded her first company, Medical Concepts, Inc., in 1985. The company was acquired by Carl Storrs Endoscopy in 1990, and Kathy was, a was the founding CEO of Inigen Inc. Other entrepreneurial companies Kathy has participated in include Agility Communications, NutriHealth Partners, and Anovium Products. From 1998 to 2012, Kathy served as director of Pacific Capital Bank Corp. Pacific Capital was acquired by Union Bank in 2012, and in addition to her work with Women's Economic Ventures, Kathy also serves on two nonprofit boards, the UCSB Economic Forecast Project and the Sustainable Change Alliance, which is a community-based impact investing firm. That's a lot. We're so happy to have you here, Kathy. <laughs> and I also mentioned uh, Matthew as well, but let's hear a little bit more about him. He has been investing in consumer and enterprise technology for the past nine years and is currently focused on technology solutions for social and environmental impact. Matthew is the founder of Tenor Partners, a tech marketing and VC advisory that has worked with over 90 tech management teams from startup to IPO and helped two dozen venture capital firms with branding, deal flow, and fundraising. He is a lecturer at UC Santa Barbara's TMP program, chair of the MIT Enterprise Forum of the Central Coast, and vice chair of the Sustainable Change Alliance, a community-focused impact investment group. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> Okay, so this is how it's gonna go. Now we have the sharks. We need some founders up here. Uh, there's three founders competing. Uh, the way it works is there's gonna be, they're going to deliver an eight minute pitch. We have our timer up here. And founders, you will be able to see the timer as you are talking so that you'll know where you're at. If uh, you finish before that eight minutes, that's fine. If the eight minute sounder uh, buzzer goes off and you're not finished you can complete that non run-on sentence <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And uh, then we'll go into the next segment, which is eight minutes of questioning from our sharks. The, sh the sharks don't have to take all of that eight minutes. They have up to eight minutes. And again, if uh, you will hear the timer go off. And if you're not finished, you, if you could just finish that line of questioning where you're at, and um, then we'll move on from there. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna be the one that's keeping us on time. Any questions about any of that? Okay, great. So then what we'd like to do is move on to our first founder who will be, be presenting, and that is Heather Lucart of Peregrine 8. Please welcome Heather. And timers, are you ready? Okay, whenever you're ready, Heather. Hello, I'm Heather Lucart. I'm here with Peregrinate Travel Gear. Our mission is to empower travelers to be adventurous, brave, and curious, and to encourage them to venture off the beaten path and explore more using our travel products that provide added safety and comfort. Travel is popular. Economy leisure travelers make up 94% of all airline passengers. In 2016, over 35 million Americans traveled overseas, and that number continues to grow. That's a 7% increase from the year prior. With the ongoing increases in luggage fees, travelers are leaning towards the most efficient luggage possible. And as adventure travel and budget flight options continue to grow, the associated level of comfort is decreasing, even as the opportunities to explore off the beaten path locations is increasing. Our target market, traveler is the 20 to 35 year old graduate student or graduate millennial. They place a high value on travel and seeking new and unique experiences and they value and understand the personal and social impact that their travel can have upon themselves and their communities as well as those of other cultures. Within this group our niche demographic is heritage travelers and transformative travelers to rapidly growing trends in recent years that require traveling off the beaten path. Heritage travelers are looking to connect with their ancestry. Since 2014, the number of travelers utilizing Airbnb to trace their roots has increased by 500%. And 78% of these trips are taken in pairs or solo, suggesting they are introspective journeys. Similarly, transformative travelers are looking for experiences that broaden perspectives and lead to personal growth. A recent study found that on a scale of one to 10, over half of the travelers surveyed ranked the importance of transformative travel as seven or higher and place an increasing value on this type of travel. The central to both of these experiences is broadening one's perspectives to encompass places, per, uh, circumstances, and that may have previously seemed forbiddingly foreign or inaccessible. Travel to these off the beaten path locations can present challenges to comfort and safety. Of the 50 travelers we interviewed in our target market, all agreed that at some point they found themselves having to sleep in an awkward or uncomfortable space. And almost all mentioned concerns about the safety of their belongings while sleeping in an unsecured place, such as an unexpected airport layover. They complained that their current solutions, rolled up sweaters or neck pillows, are too bulky, awkward, or generally lacking in comfort. Travel involves risk. For me personally, the catalytic story was from my sister, who was a traveling student while sleeping in a train station in France, had everything stolen from her, including her passport, except for the small case that was underneath her head while she was sleeping. As an avid, off the beaten path, solo female traveler myself, I knew there had to be a more secure and more comfortable way to travel. Our solution to these problems, the Falcon travel bag. Our introductory product is a carry-on size bag that also replaces your travel pillow. It can be worn as a shoulder bag or crossbody bag or as a backpack and includes secure pockets for safe storage of personal items, lowering the risk of theft not only while traveling but also while sleeping as our unique design includes a removable inflatable lining. This offers <laughs> added padding against hard or delicate items in your luggage while traveling and also when removed can be used as a neck pillow, lumbar support, seat cushion, or even a ground mat for sleeping in a pinch. The entire bag can be flipped inside out, exposing the soft surface of the inflatable pad, allowing the traveler to rest more comfortably and on their belongings while sleeping when needed, reducing the risk of theft while sleeping. 
Our last prototype received 90% validation from our customer, survey customer base, and the newest iteration, updated based on the feedback we received, is now ready for manufacturing with additional safety features, including recessed interlocking zipper poles, a security cable to attach to fixtures, and anti-slash shoulder straps. All travelers that we surveyed confirmed that what was important to them was having luggage that provided comfort and safety without loss of convenience. Our most direct competitors, the general regular travel pillow, and bag makers such as Osprey, Swiss Gear, and Timbuktu satisfy one or two of these needs, but not all of them. Only the Falcon satisfies all of these customer needs in one, and we are first to market. Our market strategy is modeled after the continuing success of past crowdfunded travel products. We'll recoup our startup expenses, prove market viability, and gather feedback by launching with our crowdfunding campaign in February. We will use Instagram and Facebook to organically grow a curated online co-op travel community of like-minded travelers who are encouraged to share their travel tips and recommendations. We will use these social media platforms to drive customers to our campaigns and subsequently our e-commerce websites, including our storefront as well as Amazon. Our goal is to create a strong brand presence that is synonymous with impeccable customer service, reliable quality products, and global responsibility via our commitment to using recycled and sustainable materials. Once we have attained our first year financial goal of 2,000 units, we will begin the process of launching our next product, a full-size backpack that utilizes the same value features and donates 1% of net as charitable contributions. Our long-term strategy is expansion via turning our competitors into retail channels as we expand the product line or exit by being acquired by like-minded companies such as REI. Our funding comes from $7,000 from friends and family and my own personal savings. Uh, plus the 3,500 in winnings from our last two pitch competitions. This has gone towards prototyping, the preliminary patent, building out the landing page, and product design. We are on schedule to launch in February of 2020, prior to which the remaining funds, including the $10,000 from this winnings, will be dedicated to securing the trademark and final patent, building out our e-commerce website, setting up the business entity, finalizing the manufacturing prototype and setup, and our pre-campaign social media advertising campaign, as the campaign management teams we have spoken to suggest a minimum of $10,000, and they also require a retainer. Our financial projections confirm our ability to start manufacturing after our minimum crowdfunding goals have been met. We are currently investigating Vietnam as a more aligned option, but as of now, we predict our COGS, based on quotes from several Chinese manufacturers, to be $35 per unit, with a retail price of $119, allowing our discounted crowdfunding price of $89 to still yield a margin of 60%. <laughs> our break-even projections state a minimum of $34,000, so this is our crowdfunding goal. However, we expect a much stronger response based on our marketing strategy, so we will set a stretch goal of $75,000, which will allow us to manufacture at a more at a lower price point. I myself am a passionate and experienced transformative traveler with a background in marketing and operations. All members of our team have extensive knowledge of small business startups. As well as an entrepreneurial spirit, we are adventurous perfectionists and we believe in the positive power of exploration because travel is important. It can help build our social and communication skills, expand our creativity, independence, and confidence, improve our flexibility and tolerance of uncertainty, and create a greater global understanding of all cultures. I myself would not be on the stage now were it not for my background in travel. And I have to share that. Our goal at Peregrinate is to create a brand that presents socially responsible values, exploration, and growth, and with 10,000, we can take off. That's the easy bit. <laughs> when you're ready, judges. Well, great job. Great job Thank presenting. Um, I have to say, you have a real personal connection to the product, and that's always really important. And I'll, and I'll share a little bit. I have had that personal pain myself. I had, uh, as a young uh, student traveling on Eurorail, fell asleep in the cabin and lost a few very precious uh, few dollars left that I had to, oh. had to call home, which really kind of ruined the whole trip for me. So yeah, Try calling uh, home now. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, what, what I really wanted to uh, understand better was uh, beyond this um, niche that you're, that you're focused on, what do you think the opportunity is in this category for a new brand? 
I, there is a, a ton of room for growth in travel just because the industry is so large and there are so many people doing it. And as it becomes more affordable, there are even more people coming on board and younger people that previously couldn't afford to necessarily go to Portugal. And now they can get a trip to Portugal for $100, but they're going to places that may not necessarily have a really strong uh, hotel system or a strong uh, trans transportation system. So a lot of the times, me personally, I just got back from Portugal and you know I rented a car, but if I hadn't been able to rent a car, I'd be taking buses here and there. And even in the rental car, I ended up homeless a couple nights because when I booked into the hotel, the infrastructure doesn't, isn't there and then I didn't have a hotel, it literally didn't exist. So I ended up sleeping in the car on my pillow, <laughs> which thankfully I had brought, of course. So, and, and then adjusted a couple things based on that. So I think that there is a, a lot of room for expansion for all generations, for all different people, even especially airline travelers that can use it as a neck pillow. Yeah, the trends sound really compelling. How about the, the actual market for bags? Do you have a sense of you know, how many are purchased annually? Yes. And, yeah, and so it's, it's, one of, it's one of the largest markets in textiles. And the backpack industry is increase, increases by 3.5% every year. They have a large, uh, I think it's 35% of the market is, is travel bags, travel backpacks specifically. So, and it is a growing market every year. There's, there are more people getting into it, but there's also a higher demand for it. We believe our product is specific. We believe it is a category maker that no one else can, is currently doing. They can do it, but because we'll have the stronger brand presence, people will be encouraged to buy from us. always liked the product, seen it before. Um, I think it's a great idea, and like Matthew, I had a similar experience on a train in Germany, fell asleep, got my passport <laughs> stolen, and all my credit cards. So I can, I can certainly see the need for it. What, um, you said you're filing for a patent. Okay? I'm sorry? You said you, there's, there, on your notes, you said something about a patent. Yes. Okay, so you believe that there, that there is a patent available we believe, for a specific feature set? We, we believe there is a design patent available 100%. Whether there is a utility patent is something that we will look into once we've really finalized all of the details of it. Unfortunately, with textiles, the reality is that if you move a zipper, it's a different design. Right. So really, anyone can just move a zipper. And even so, your patent is only as strong as the money you have to put behind it in court. And large companies tend to have more money. So in my experience from talking to other creators, cease and desist is really all you can generally do. Okay. Uh, so paying for that patent, especially if you're paying worldwide, is incredibly expensive and may not necessarily, th those funds we believe can be better put into building the brand strength. I agree with you actually. Yeah. That was why I asked. Oh, um, <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so your, uh, your backpack serves other purposes, like it does replace a, tra uh, a travel pillow. What's the average cost for someone to buy a lightweight backpack like that plus a travel pillow? Mm. Depending on the cost. So you can get ones off of Amazon for $20. If you want something that's sustainable, it uses sustainable materials and has a brand behind it, it's around 120 mm -hmm. which is why we're pricing it there. And we feel we have more value because of the pillow as well. The pillows can range from $10 to $40. The really good ones that, are on, that have been crowdfunded that are really successful tend to be around the $35 to $40 range. So compare, compiled together from our target market, they would be spending about $160, okay. um, crowdfunding. Um, you, your goals for crowdfunding are actually pretty modest. Yes. Okay. Uh, why select that? Because the 35,000 is the minimum for us to manufacture what we need from that run and manufacture additional product to sell on Amazon and cover our startup expenses. When you, it's my understanding that when you set a lower goal on crowdfunding, once you surpass that goal, you are then much pushed much more on the website. So the e earlier you pass the goal, the more likely you are to get more coverage and actually reach a higher goal. Okay, so so the lower you can set the goal, the better, but because Kickstarter is an all or nothing, Indiegogo has tiers, but we wanna do Kickstarter. It, we wanna set the lowest goal to make sure that we can meet that, and then once that's met within day one or two, we will be featured on their front page. Okay, um, so it sounds like you have talked to some people who have conducted successful crowdfunding yes. campaigns. Yes, yeah. Because we have a couple people here in town. Quite a few in Santa Barbara. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. Um, go ahead, yeah. Tyler, what's your um, Great pitch, by the way. Thank great, 
Very clear, very concise, uh, great product. And you said you're currently manufacturing in Vietnam? We're looking into Vietnam. We've okay. looked into China, we've got quotes from China. However, most of the people that I speak to, most of the mentors I've spoken to do tech. So the ones that do do fa um, textiles say that Ve Vietnam is, has the same quality yeah. and they have the same infrastructure and they care the same amount, they have the same um, certifications that you would need. Right. They're expected now, but they're cheaper. And how would you be thinking about quality control if you were looking at China um, as far as maintaining your product? So both ways the product would be shipped to us so we can test it. Our t intention is to test every 15th model, 15th piece, take it out, test it, test another 15th piece just to make sure that all 1,000 of the first run are good. But also we have eight different, we're allowed eight different uh, mock-ups so we can, within those eight, we can make changes and uh, make sure the quality control is there. And as far as the sustainable materials, have you thought about where you're going to be sourcing those from going forward and what yes. you could scale with? Right, right. So, and there is an, uh, there is an issue with scale if you, if you choose a particular um, thing to back, right? So if it's uh, used sails from Vietnamese boats, that there's a, a limited number of that available. Right. But we're intending to do not one particular thing. So it is, it's ne not necessarily recycled, but non-virgin materials. Mm -hmm and sustainable, sustainably sourced. We have uh, companies that can source it for us and we also, the factories have also offered to source it. And those, mat those materials come with their own certification. Mm -hmm. So regardless of the manufacturer's certification, the fabrics have to come with a certification. And it is more expensive. And but we believe that our market will pay for once, once that's what they want. We know that that's what they want. And then as far as product design, um, is it you or do you have a team that's working on the engineering design elements of this as you continue to extend your product line? Right, so I did the initial design. Wait, the tech pack you have in front of you is from a designer that worked with me hand in hand to move a couple things around and just get it, because she makes bags for a living, just kind of streamline that. And now the manufacturer that we're speaking with, I'm speaking with, or one of them, says that they will also do prototyping on their side. So they will revamp it to be what they need for manufacturing, which is the expense for manufacturing setup, which is a little steep because that actually gets it to the point where it can be manufactured right. and it's the most efficient design it can be. Because sometimes moving a zipper saves you a dollar. Yeah. So that's the, they're going to revamp it as well. Okay. Thank you. I thought you did a great job. I, my judges are great here that are next to me because they asked a lot of the questions I had, so yeah. we're out of time, but you did a wonderful job. So thank you, and I totally see the need, so I, I wish I had it when I was traveling <laughs> I was gonna say, did you get pickpocketed? <laughs> uh, yeah, I've had a few things stolen, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Dobson, Mrs. Henley, Mr. Mrs. O'Dell, and Mr. Stotts. My name is Jacob Zander, and this is my brand called Foot Soles. So, so my foot soles are made to Converse to give your Converse comfort, support, and cushioning, and also inspire you to live a life you want to relive. And so you're probably wondering, why just Converse? So today, Converse sells over 270,000 pairs of the classic Chuck Taylors daily, and this is a market that hasn't been tapped into yet. And throughout, the past, and throughout the past years, Converse has been growing steadily and still continues to grow. So this is a classic brand that has stood the test of time. And as of 2019, it marks its 100th year of the chat that Chuck Taylor has been around. And so right now, we plan to acquire 1% of the, market, the Converse market within the next three years, which will equate to 14.7 million in revenue. And throughout the past three months, we've been learning through Facebook and Instagram ads that our core audience are women ages 18 to 24 and 25 to 34 who are in college and then also after college. And the reason they will buy foot soles is because they love our whole message to live a life you would want to relive. And they also want to be comfy while they're going to work, they're in college, and they're also going to concerts and music festivals. So for example, in addition to the benefit of the support for their feet, they are buying the foot soles because they want to be comfortable while they are enjoying life. And so our foot soles provide arch support and cushioning, are made to each size in Converse, and also slip in with no hassle. So, here, so for example, my, I'm a size eight and a half in Converse, and you simply pull the foot soles out, and then grab your pair of Converse, and it is slipping super easy with no hassle, and now you're walking on a cloud. 
And so when I asked my target demographic what they wanted from my foot soles, they said they wanted it to fit into their Converse. It would, they could pick it according to their shoe size. It would provide arch support and cushioning. And as you can see, none of my competitors can do this. The foot sole sales strategy includes two sales channels. Our wholesale channel includes three target, re three target retailers, which include Urban Outfitters, Tilly's, and ASOS. Right now, we are currently in conversation with Urban Outfitters, which I had a phone call with one of the buyers with last night. And if you have any questions about that, you can ask me in the Q&As after. And once they have placed an order with us, we will, be move, we will move to Tilly's and then ASOS, who I have direct connections with. And we will see a purchase order from ASOS and Tilly's within the next three months. And so right here, this is an example of how the, uh, of how the foot soles will be displayed within Urban Outfitters. And so they'll be displayed together with the Converse and the foot soles. And then also on Urban Outfitters' online website, it'll be displayed as when you, when you buy a pair of Converse, it'll say, we also suggest that people also buy foot soles for Converse. And our marketing strategy includes creating organic content on all these social platforms. And we will also be running ads on all these platforms. And we'll be market testing and driving traffic to our website. Since April 12, 2019, we have sold 700 foot soles. And 63% of that has been in-person sales of me selling everything. And the feedback so far on, on all those in-person sales has been incredible. I asked these customers like what they wanted to change from the product, and they said nothing. They loved it. So all I need now is more capital to get the product out there, because it just needs a little push to get it out into the world. Our year-to-date startup financials include our revenue with my personal investment of $24,000 the previous winnings, and then my sales to date, which is $10,000. And on the expenses side, it has the production, my legal, marketing, shipping, travel, and equipment, which comes out to $40,000, $395. And as you can see, I haven't been taking any of that money. It's all been going directly back into the company. And for the year to come, starting today, we'll be using the 10K anticipated winnings for $1,800 in legal expenses, $2,000 for our Facebook and Instagram marketing campaign, the Vans Foot Soles molds, 880 to expedite production for retailers. And also, we're going to start production of more foot soles so we're in stock and ready to fill these orders from the retailers that we are anticipating. And the anticipated sales of the year moving forward is $220,000. And this, the production that will need that will be costing $62,000 in inventory. If you have any questions about the Vans Foot Soles, please ask me in the Q&As after. And so right now, my team consists of my consultants, who my legal advisor is Eric Zander, and my business operation consultants is Gordon and Todd. My wholesale connection is Trace, is Trace Riordan. My marketing is Robin, and my SEO marketing is, who's helping me there is Eric Peterson. And on the foot sole side, we have my three interns and my two part-time contractors who have been helping me with my bookkeeping and also my IP attorney. And to conclude my presentation, I wanted to conclude with this review from Katie. And she says, so comfortable. I've worn my chucks every day since putting these lovely cloud-like dreams on. And they're just as comfortable as when I first got them, buying them for my family for Christmas. So why this review is important is because it's number one direct. It's a repeat buyer. And then she's also buying gifts for her family and her friends. So thank you so much, and fill your soul. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I actually do have a very uncomfortable pair of Vans, so I'm curious to know about that. But yeah. um, so when I've been selling these in person, yeah, I people come up to me. They're like, if they're if they don't wear Converse, like, well, do you make them for Vans? I'm like, yeah, I have I have prototypes and all of that. And I'm like, I didn't think that either when I was first going into it. But there are people who wear Vans who don't have the like the comfy cush ones, and who are like, I just want to put these in my classic Vans. And so that's where, that's where we're going next, is because that's what people are asking for. And so that's the like, next growth step of it. 
Okay. So, yeah. So I'm kind of curious to know along those lines, um, do you have to do a specific, because I, I, my, my real question that I was mm -hmm. thinking about was just the scalability across different product lines. Do you have to do a different mold, you know what I mean, per shoe, or is this something that you can so, create something that's applicable across yeah. <laughs> brand? Or I, I'm kind of curious like where you want to go with it, and, and, or is it so specific that you have to make it per shoe? So the, the um, plan with it is to keep it with Converse and Vans, possibly Doc Martens, to see like we can test that when we get there. But basically classic shoes that people love and they are wearing every day. And, because, and so basically it's like, it's keeping that, it's keeping that um, the, the brand all, all, like, all tied together because all the three, these, those Converse and Vans are really pretty similar. And it's the same like target demographic. And so we're not, say, say if we made an uh, insole for like Nikes or something, then Nike or Nike's are already comfortable, and then it would kind of take away the branding of it, and it wouldn't be. There's so many Nikes out there that it'd be. It wouldn't work super well, and Got so that's it. what I've learned is because the soles just go on top of the soles that are already in your Converse, and so you don't have to remove anything. And that's the Converse and Vans are are the only two shoes that you can do that with, and they're like the, the one of the two biggest shoe classic shoe companies like right now. So, yeah, totally. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, great brand. Really uh, uh, love the way you're talking about uh, f you know, filling your soul yeah. <laughs> and working off a lot of the puns from, from shoes. Um, really a question about how you're going to manage the relationship with these big brands. So my understanding is uh, Chuck Taylors are owned by Nike, is that correct? Yes. And Vans was also recently acquired by a very large uh, company, yes. I believe, yeah. also owns North Face, right? So yeah. um, how do you plan to, to deal with, um, you know, any kinds of infringement on their brands, or how are you, how are you gonna kind of walk that tightrope? So I basically, I have, all this is, um, I've had all my attorneys look at it, it's all IP safe. And so Chuck Taylor, I, I've, all my packaging, like as you see on my packaging, it says for your Chucks. And so for your Chucks, like Chuck, Chucks isn't trademarked, and so we can use Chucks. And then on the Vans packaging, it'll say for your, and then Vans in small writing, because you can do that if you have you can put a trademark on a box as long as it's small enough, and so as long as it's not like drawing attention, like right when someone sees it. So, like for example, before I had that printed, I had Chuck Taylors in big bold letters where the four-year Chucks is, and they that would have been a no-no. So that's where I came in with that. Well, maybe a quick follow-up on brand because uh, you talk about the the Urban Outfitters channel, and mm -hmm. it seems to me that this is a great brand for the Instagram and the direct-to-consumer. Uh, talk about your channel strategy yeah. and, 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 uh -huh. and why you're doing both in-store and... So the goal with Urban Outfitters is to drive awareness and help them get the, get the spread the message out there. And the Urban has that cool branding to it too as well. And so with that, I'm gonna use, Ur I'm gonna use these, the three retailers to help push it. And then I can also drive my, tr and then my awareness will grow through that and drive it through social media. And that's where my, that's where my, um, this next month is where I've been needing the funding a lot mostly is through Facebook and Instagram ads. It's because I haven't been able to run enough ads to A-B test everything. And so with this capital, I could run all those A-B tests and figure out exactly all the target, the exact target demographics. So, yeah. Um, actually, you should always consider both channels. Oh, yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> okay, because because it has been proven in online marketing that without a physical presence, it's much tougher to scale your brand mm -hmm. beyond a certain point. Um, the other thing that would make it tough to scale um, is I'm looking at your financials. Um, your marketing costs are incredibly low. Um, I don't understand the shipping line. Um, and I'm skipping all the things about the product because I actually like the product. Mm -hmm. I think that it's, I think the product's a great idea. I have no idea why Converse and, um, and Vans or whatever, or Dr. Scholl's wouldn't do it, but I'm assuming there's enough room in the market for mm -hmm. you because you're not violating anybody's patents. So when you look at these costs, um, now you, you have a zero for a survival paycheck. How yeah. do you survive? I. I do, um, so on Sundays in LA, I do these little pop-up markets, and I sell my, I sell handmade stuff I handmake, and then that supports me throughout my whole week. Okay, so. but you're not gonna build a company by not paying yourself or not paying your employees, <laughs> so. Um, not paying myself for the moment. Okay, Yes. so, um, so again, I, one of my concerns is looking at financials like these, because I think that your, your company has a, an opportunity mm -hmm. to scale. 
Um, is anybody getting paid right now? Um, no. Just my bookkeeper, and then when I, for, we, I pay him 200 bucks a month to do my, all my bookkeeping. And then when I need legal advice, I use Judith Schelling for my legal advice. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the online sales number. Um, it, what did you try in online? Because you had good luck when you're out talking individually to yeah. people. But you do want to validate the market when there's no personal presence there. Mm -hmm. So online sales weren't that high? So to um, answer it? your question about the online marketing part, like when you said my marketing budget isn't big enough, it's because I haven't had the money to put my money in the marketing budget because that's what I, my marketing budget is what I need the most is for the $10,000. And so with um, what, I've been, what I haven't been able to do yet is I haven't been able to A-B test enough ads and you need about $2,000 to start out with that so you can see what's really working. I found a couple ads that were working, that, that one that was working super well and then I wasn't able to run it after that for some like IP reasons along since I, I'll tell you the story on it. So I work at Trader Joe's one day a week, and I made an ad directly to everyone in the company of Trader Joe's nationwide, and I sent it out to everyone, and it did so well. I was selling so many foot soles, but then they said I couldn't run it because I was at Trader Joe's. So <laughs> that's okay, the story. Interesting on that. strategy. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, this is near and dear to my heart. I actually got married in a pair of Chuck Taylors. <laughs> um, I, I'm no longer within Feel your yourself. target demographic, but I still have several pair in my closet that I would wear more often if I knew about these. Yeah. Um, a couple of comments about the financials, but first, have you tapped into the medical community as far as it being an orthotic or something to get an endorsement from a medical professional on how it could help from an ergonomic perspective or I, otherwise because of how flat Chuck Taylor's yeah. are? Yeah, so I, what I, the whole brand is the part, the part of the brand, I don't know if you'll agree with this, but is my consumer, like people, kids are like, like 18 to 24 and then 25 to 34, they don't really want to hear about the, the medical benefits of it. That's kind of where Dr. Scholes comes in and yeah. that's, that's what makes it kind of uncool. If that, that. Okay. <laughs> so Dr. Scholes cool. Okay. <laughs> so I. <laughs> That's kind of the reason with that. <laughs> um, yeah, and just real quick, uh -huh. uh, wearing the banker hat, because I believe in this, I would just spend a little bit more time on the financials, make them a little bit more believable. Okay. I think the margins might be a little out of whack, um, especially as you start to scale. So maybe pay more than 200 bucks a month to a bookkeeper and really hone in on the financials, especially okay. on the forecast. Yeah. That but sounds great. Good job. Did you guys, I, I did put in my executive summary if anyone brought Converse that they could try it. I'm not sure if you remember our Converse. And next up we have Joe Dottillo of Dottillo Custom Leather Goods. Right. Hello everybody, my name is Giuseppe Dottillo and I'm the founder and craftsman of Dottillo Custom Leather Goods. I'd like to begin by thanking the Scheinfeld Center and Julie Sampson for making this entire event possible and giving me the opportunity to participate. I'd also like to thank my personal mentor, John Richardson, for sticking with me through this whole process, as well as all the other mentors, for their knowledge and expertise was truly instrumental in our success. Now, the problem. In today's leather goods market, there's a vast array of products that all seem to look exactly the same. Now, I'm speaking to the women in the room here. How many of you would like to walk into a room and see four different women carrying the same exact bag as you? Not very many of you, I'd assume and I know just how you can keep that from happening. Dottillo Custom Leather Goods present a unique blend of modern design and traditional Western tooling that is unseen anywhere else on the marketplace today. Another thing that sets Dottillo apart from the competition is that I'm blessed to come from a family who has a rich heritage in fashion. This dapper young man up here is my grandfather, Giuseppe, who I'm named after who spent 35 years tailoring men's clothing in Anaheim as well as in my hometown of Hemet. He's the one that I draw much of my inspiration from and I have adopted his original logo and artwork to my own business to represent the next generation of Dottillo craftsmen. His two brothers were also involved in fashion. His brother Akili was a women's clothing designer. His brother Nunziato was the one who brought those designs to life. This tradition of Dottillo men in fashion is one that I hold very near and dear to me and I hope that I'll be able to make them proud by continuing and pursuing my craft. As I have implied before, there are many other makers on the market today, but none stand out like Dottillo. 
Many of them utilize cheap, flimsy leather and thin thread, creating products that you'd be lucky to have last you a few years. Datillo products, on the other hand, are made from materials that you could find in any good saddle maker shop, ensuring that they will last you a lifetime. My pricing is very competitive, yet still offers me a very comfortable gross profit margin, average gross profit margin of 51%, with cost of goods sold, including materials, as well as my labor at $50 an hour. Market size and opportunity. Market research shows that not only are leather goods in currently in high demand, but the market has been steadily increasing over the past decade. According to the market analysis tool Size Up, in the Santa Barbara area alone, $1 to $1.1 million is spent on leather goods annually. Business model and timeline. Datillo Custom Leather Goods is a sole proprietorship in which I currently run all business operations. And the timeline for my business is as follows. Stage one is the current stage. In this stage, I'm establishing the framework for my business and using it as a revenue stream while I'm a student. At 19 years old, I'm the youngest one of the group, and I'm currently a student here at City College. Stage two is expansion. Once I have my established business, I will turn it into my full-time job and work on creating a brand name for my products. And stage three is sustaining a small business. In stage three, I will increase revenues. In stage three, I will increase revenues by increasing my prices to a more premium price point based on my built-up brand. And by doing this, rather than trying to greatly increase my production capacity, I'll be able to keep the production of my products under my personal control while I can delegate other business operations such as marketing, web design, bookkeeping, and other day-to-day -day operations to other people to allow me to scale. Sales and marketing. Sales will be made primarily online through my e-commerce website. Although, word of mouth sales and referrals, which currently drive my business, will surely continue as well. Marketing will also be done primarily online, focusing on social media and search engine optimization under the advice of mentor Eric Peterson. Get Real Milestones. During the Get Real Accelerator, it was my goal to turn my passion into my business and that's just what I've done. Some of the milestones I've achieved are I have acquired the necessary licenses and permits, I've established a functioning e-commerce website, I've made consistent sales throughout, turning profits at low production numbers, and I've built a small network of advisors and mentors that I did not have prior to this competition. And another milestone that I've achieved that is not included on this slide that I feel is just as important as any is that now, through this competition, I have a much more clear picture of where I'd like to take this business in the future, and I know I have a much more thorough understanding of how to get it there. <coughs> All right, financial summary. So now I'll take you through a short financial summary for the period requested in the guidelines. So we can see on my income statement that I sold around $1,800 worth of products during this period, which yielded me about $700 net income, which I then invested directly into purchasing materials and improving my equipment, which then in turn increased my business assets, which I conservatively estimate to be right now around $5,400. Support and mentors. During the Get Real program, I've made some valuable connections with mentors and advisors, including John Richardson, my personal business mentor, uh, Eric Peterson of Mission Web Marketing, Matthew Berger, attorney, and of course, Julie Sampson, who's always there for overall support to help you make connections and somehow affectionately tear apart everything you think you know about your business. <laughs> now, before I move on to my final slide, I'd like to say that this program has been truly instrumental in the development of my business. And even if I weren't to walk away with any award money today, I would feel blessed just to have gotten to participate and meet such amazing people. Now, if I were to win, the money would go to who deserves it? All of the founders. I would take $1,000 of the prize money and give it to each of the other three founders whose dedication, success, dedication, success has inspired me to continue through this program. With the remainder of the funds, I would use $1,500 towards creating an inventory, $1,000 towards web design, $1,000 towards advertising. I would invest $1,500 in machinery. I'd keep $1,300 as operating reserves, and I'd give $700 as tithes to my church 
to thank God for his great blessings and the opportunity to participate in such a wonderful program. Thank you. Can you hand me my water? I'm thirsty. Oh, I didn't, see any, I didn't see any money up there for the sharks, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Here, let me bring these down real quick so you can guys can look at them. Did one fall? Oh, it's just over there. Okay, well, we're going to start asking okay, questions while fine. you're doing that, okay? Um, okay, first of all, um, that's what I wanted to see. Was it a close up? <laughs> so obviously you're a very talented and skilled craftsman. And, you know, you asked about whether I want to walk into a room and see four other women carrying the same purse as I do. Um, for my standard everyday purse, I probably don't care. But this is a piece of luxury goods. And one of the things I'm concerned about in the way you're approaching the market is luxury goods need to be sold differently than commodities. Yes. Okay. This is not a commodity, and, it, and selling it online may become difficult. So have you thought about the fact that there are many, many retailers in the Western states yes. that so, would carry this? So the reason I'm priced competitively right now is that you can't really begin to start pre charge premium prices unless you have a brand name that people want to pay for. So, and I know there's a, there's a lot of locals that I know, like Stephen at Makesmith, I know he's a Weave client, so, but he's a great guy, and I know there's a lot of competition, but what sets my products apart is that I can do the tooling. So the tooling is my real, that's my, that's what sets me apart, and that's what would make my product a premium product. Oh, it does make my product a premium product. I'm going to dispute your um, pricing strategy, okay? Um, one of the things that you will find almost impossible is to raise prices. And I think that even though you don't have a brand, what you need is exposure. And when you are exposed, like even if you were to take these up to Jedlicas, which is no longer in Santa Barbara, but is in, you know, Santa Los Inez Amigos. or something. Okay, there's a couple stores up there. Um, you want it to start out by screaming to your customer, this is quality, and it's priced as such. Because if you yeah. underprice it, then I'm going to say, what am I missing? Why mm -hmm. is it not? I think it's quality, but your price is telling me it isn't. Yeah. Well, you can look at my price. I have prices inside that tote right there if you want to look at them. That bag that you're holding in front of you is 475 Okay. And that bag and the backpack is 455 So they're priced. They're, okay. They're, they're, re they're priced so at what they should be. <laughs> And, but, you're, and you're, but your margin on them is 51 percent, right? Yes. Okay, that's still something that, of course, maybe that gets adjusted with, um, sorry, I'm not six inches from the microphone. Maybe that gets adjusted as you start producing more of them, because I'd like to see the margin a little bit higher. Definitely. So right now, okay. since I have such, I'm not making a ton of them, and they're all made to order, if I were to produce five at the same time, it'd take me a lot less time. I'm going I'm to agree with Kathy here and just um, and, and, and maybe encourage you a little bit because you have such a powerful family story and I think that can be such a, a, a really great asset for the brand in this age of authenticity when folks are looking to connect with something that has meaning beyond just the product itself. So um, I, I'm going to support my, my fellow shark here and say you ought to raise prices because of your family. I think you have a great story here. Well, thank you. I actually, but my question was around pricing, so thank you for answering that. Um, I was just kind of curious, you know, how you, what do you consider your target market? What's the average price, you know what I mean, per mm -hmm. like bag they're usually spending? And then how do you think about stylizing and creating for that target market? And just kind of what have you done around validation and your current customers? That's kind of like five questions in one. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. so, do what you can. With so, it. Um, I'd say my primary, primary target market is for sure women, because the bags are what I really like to make. I have men's goods as well. I make wallets. I do belts, a lot of custom tooled stuff. But um, as far as validation goes, the reason I started doing this was because people wanted to buy them. And it was mostly women who really loved my bags. So, and let's see. Okay, there's a bunch to pull apart. Stylizing them, I have a few different styles like these in the Chrome Excel leather are the more kind of standard model while somebody who wants more of a statement piece is going to buy the tooled one. So there's different price points for people who are looking for something different. Like those would be more of an everyday carry while that would be more of a statement, you know. 
Is there anything I didn't get to in your questions? No, I threw a lot at you. I know. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I was also just kind of curious. I mean, I, women, I would assume, but just kind of, you know, if do you have a good sense for demographically kind of age and what they want to spend yeah, and what their average spend is on bags? I mean, how do you fit in that kind of along with what they're saying? Are you priced right? And, you know, are you really kind of honing in on, on who that market is? Yeah, I'd say that primarily my demographic is probably about 25 to 45 okay. because that's who really likes this kind of stuff, especially the big bags. Like that one is like a working woman's bag. It has a bunch of organization stuff inside of it. So, uh, Sorry, I got, there's so much to unravel. <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Where did okay. you get the statistics about the Santa Barbara market? Um, there's an online resource called Size Up. I went to the Santa Barbara library and I had the resource librarian help me get my statistics. And is that online sales or things that are purchased here? Um, that's locally? things purchased here in Santa Barbara locally. So I'd be tapping into a much larger market than right. that. So, so then so what would your forecast best case scenario of success look like? I mean, it's got to be bigger than paying yourself fifty dollars an hour. So, like, how much do you think I could sell in no, a year? No, what is what? What would success look like to you? Success to me would be a self-sustaining small business selling about two hundred fifty thousand dollars plus a year, be able to live a comfortable life, doing what I love, create, carry on my family's passion, and carry on my family's tradition of detailed men in fashion. Yeah, and that's something that's also kind of, I'm different from the others, is everybody else kind of has like a product that's like big scale, get it out there, while me, I'm more of a small business. And it's like, that's how I want to keep it. These bags are, especially the tooled ones, that's a piece of art. And if I were to give that, if I were to increase production to have other people come in and try to do that, it wouldn't be my work. It wouldn't be a Dottillo bag. You, you said the magic word, though, sustainable, all right? And so one of the things I'm going to encourage you and each of the other founders to do is to consider financial literacy to be an essential skill for mm -hmm. running a business um, because there are a lot of assumptions in here that aren't going to play out this way, and that's mm -hmm. fine. The first business plan I wrote, my assumptions didn't play out the way that I wrote. So mm -hmm. I, it, no question about that. But but it is absolutely critical because what we see with most small businesses is that sustainability is only unless something happens. And as we saw with the Thomas fire and everything, so many of our small businesses couldn't survive two to three weeks. Mm -hmm. So I want you to make it because I like you. You're a good <laughs> thank guy. Thank you. Well, thank you. Is that everybody? Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Raisa from the foundation, and we would like to say thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> and then once again, thank you also to the Chamber of Commerce for the year membership that the winner will get, and also to Impact Hub. Uh, each of the participants actually in the accelerator will get a free month's membership there. All right, so founders then, if you could come up. Thank you. So again, really, really great job, all three of you. Uh, Giuseppe, I, I asked that last question as far as what success looks like to you. And uh, I appreciate your response. You know, maybe as an investor, I might not appreciate that response as much. Um, but as an individual that doesn't see as many 19-year-olds out there with the type of passion that you have for something that's sustainable and a lifestyle, that's really neat. I mean, I see people that are looking to retire and still trying to figure out what they want to do when they grow up. So kudos to you and great job. Okay, um, Heather, I'm gonna give you a little feedback. Uh, I think collectively, we all, uh, as we said, understand your product. I think we can all relate to it. And, um, I, you know, we're discussing it, we all think you definitely can build a business with it. Um, we were all very impressed with how prepared you were in terms of all your materials. Um, you know, just end to end, it was really, really impressive, and we really like your plan and your go-to-market. Um, I think if we're going to give any, cre you know, um, feedback on it, I think 
presentation wise, we'd love to see you be able to get up there and be confident and, and without your cards and that sort of thing. And I think, you know, everyone has different personalities, so it's not a knock. It's just something that you know your stuff so well. So I think our feedback would just be trust it and go own it. Um, but, you know, overall, we, we really, really enjoyed um, your presentation. And like I said, your materials are great. So thank you. Jake, um, I, we have to congratulate you just on how hard you're working, the different jobs and, and your entrepreneurial spirit and how you uh, took over the Trader Joe's uh, for your early marketing and customer validation. So um, uh, congratulations just to ha for having that entrepreneurial spirit. And I think, um, you know, w one thing we'd really like to see is just a better grasp of overall the numbers of your business and of uh, the market itself in, in greater detail. And we think you'll have opportunity to, to, to grow into that, but really got to know your numbers and, and really have them down pat. Again, um, we were so impressed with all of you. Each of you has a viable product, and I think each of you may have different long-term goals, but it is wonderful to see three young entrepreneurs up here that we think are all going to be successful in their businesses, okay? So that said, our assignment here was get real Shark Tank, okay? And, and so we have to look at the, at the person that we think through the accelerator process has made the most progress in getting real. And that person is Foot Souls. Thank you so much, judges, and thank you for everyone for coming to all my supporters. Um, yeah, it, my goal is just to inspire people to live a life you'd relive, and so that's what I'm trying to do. So, thank you so much. Oh, um, I think additionally, what I'd like to say to, to, to all of you is that we really were impressed. And I know for myself personally, if I can provide any advice or connect you to any mentors or anything like that, um, I'm here to do that. And I think, you know, the others are too. So please, please reach out. We've got a, a very entrepreneurially supportive community, and you should tap into every one of us. And to the mentors who are in the room, I want to say congratulations, uh, you know, on all of your contributions that we see um, up here in the pitches that these students did and in the work that they did with their businesses. And to the rest of you, I want to tell you, if you liked this, this could be you. We have the setup here, the program to take you from idea to startup and to have all the support in between. We don't do it ourselves. We lean on our community and all the experts um, who give so freely of their expertise and time. And we're so thankful that brings us to the Sharks. Thank you so much for your time and expertise here for your offer to go even further with the students with uh, additional feedback and mentoring if they need it. And we, it's people like you that make this program great. So you'll just have to carry it back to them to say how well, how much we love them, right? So be sure to go back and say, hey, Julie said that you are loved and appreciated, right? <laughs> All right, I think that's a wrap then. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Sharks. <laughs> You're welcome to continue networking on the patio.